Well, guys, I think everybody here has already met Gary and Sue Kessler. But you know what? Let's give God a praise clap for them. Amen. Hey. And uh, Sarah Chang is recording this, so uh -oh. you know, uh, I just I just ask you to bear that in mind. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so we want to support and encourage you, and you are supporting and encouraging us. Nice. And this is this is exciting. This is exciting. Great. And this is our first for us as a church. Uh -huh. So thank um, you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord be with you, and also, and with, also you. with you. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of missions. Thank you for the good works that you've prepared in advance, and we thank you, Father for the promise of your son that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And we thank you that the victory is already ours uh, in Christ and through Christ. And so we thank you for this victory march. And we know that it's not always easy. And there certainly are setbacks and challenges. But thank you for saying us the comforter, to comfort and to guide us in our journey in this world. And so, Father, we thank you for Gary and Sue, for the work they've already done and the work that you have in store for them to do. And we pray for your abundant blessings upon their um, support raising and their team building and their vision casting in our congregation and beyond. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, we pray for regular and strong communication and uh, partnership just on many different levels. And so, Father, bless this time of sharing uh, from Gary and Sue with us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, we really value this time to be able to uh, expand a little bit on what we were briefly able to share with everyone during the service. And um, so what we, I think we'll do is we'll go through the slides that you um, saw during the service and maybe go through some quickly, more quickly than we're... Uh, than we did uh, because we've already seen them. But also, so we can get to the other slides that you haven't seen, because it's in those other slides that uh, we talk about what life in Belize is like. Sorry, just one second to see if we can get ourselves turned on again. On each table, there you'll find a sign-up sheet. And while we're at it, let me uh, go ahead and just uh, uh, show you. These are the, uh, the prayer cards that I'd mentioned during service. Take one of these home. They're just the right size for a bookmark. They have a little bit of our bio on us and a few other things as well. Um, Pastor mentioned that uh, of your support as a church body, and we can't tell you how... How grateful we are for that. On the tables, you'll see these cards. I guess these are for your use. If you should want to support us, please use this card. Um, you can send it to us directly uh, to the Synod, but um, since uh, you've already been so gracious to us, I think we ought to go right through your, uh, your own church here. And um, so use that card for that. And of course, the last thing you see on the table is our sign-up sheet for our newsletter. And uh, we're required, expected, it's our, it's our joy to be able to share with go. you Thanks. once um, a month. You should be hearing from us. Okay, looks like we are ready to go. Let's, get, yeah. Let's begin. Okay, as I said before, that's where Belize you know, people sometimes get uh, a little confused about where Belize is, and it's, it's in that little circle. It's at the very base of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's uh, uh, bordered uh, by uh, Mexico to the north, Guatemala to the south. 
doesn't really share a border with Honduras, but there's a lot of travel across the bay into Belize. So if you go to the very far part, um, the southern part of Belize, you'll, you'll meet a lot of Hondurans there. Belize is known as a, a tourist destination. It's a very popular with the tourists, especially if you're into the water sports, if you're a scuba diver, if you're a, a, a deep sea fisherman. Uh, and now, lately, they've gotten into uh, adventure tourism, zip lining, rafting down rivers into caving, as well as uh, ecotourism. So they realize what a gem they have in the country and they take very, very good care of the environment, and yes, they realize it's a tourist destination. Do you have a chart? I've read several times, you know, that it's a real popular destination for expats. It is, as a, as a matter of fact, it's true. Uh, it has become a real destination for expat Americans and Canadians. Um, the dollar goes further. In fact, you can use U.S. greenbacks in Belize. And the exchange rate is pegged at two to one. And it's been that way for decades. They just decided that's what it's going to be and they leave it there. They don't mess around with it. So your conversion couldn't be hardly any easier. Um, you'll see all your prices in Belize dollars, but you know, just half the price. That's what it would cost you with an American yeah, back home. Um, so uh, that's another nice thing and another reason why so many expats want to move down there. It's become a retirement center just for that. Sure, the, the weather's nice. It can flat be really hot during our summertime, your, same as ours. So uh, yeah, that, that is true. And um, we don't tend to work in those areas. And let me just stand up to the map here and show you. These islands are the, the primary tourist destinations, but not surprisingly. There's a peninsula, it doesn't really show you here, it's kind of right down there. And uh, that's called the Placencia Peninsula. The one church that we'll show you a photo of again as we do our presentation is in a town called Senbite. And that's where that church is. And we do Word and Sacrament down there every other, uh, every other Sunday. We, we are unable to do it every Sunday because we just don't have enough pastors. Frankly, we're at least one pastor short, possibly two if we wanted to cover the whole country. But God will provide as he will provide. Um, so why don't we continue? Sure. You can see we're in Belmapan. That is the yeah. Cayo district. That's the farming district. So we're not on the coastal area. Um, we're not sitting there drinking margaritas or anything. Like that. It's <laughs> right. a, we're, we're pretty busy. Um, I work in Valley of Peace. Valley of Peace was created, and I mentioned at church a little bit, by the Belizean government for refugees um, for the neighboring Latin American countries. So primarily, um, you'll find Spanish in that community. The church. Um, building that Gary is going to tell you that he rehabbed and um, the, the preschool that I work in are plucked right in the middle of Valley of Peace and the church, the Lutheran church wanted to bring English to that community so their children would be successful in the, in the school system because if they don't know English and if they can't function they frankly they can get a job at a very young age and then their family stays the same. You always want your children to do better than you and for the economy to kind of change and grow with the country um, and with that valley. And that's not happening because they are not finishing education. They're coming out. There's plenty of work and there's plenty of food in Belize. It's just that um, they're still, they're, they stay at the same level. So that was something that we, I was asked to do to bring that English to the preschool there um, in that space. And that's the preschool that what the building looks like on the outside. The church is right to the side there. Uh, I enhanced the education that the, the 
assistant that we have that's been running it uh, has been building, giving her ideas and mentoring her through. And finally, we got her to sign up for um, her, her uh, education. But I also bring the word of God, most especially to these children, through stories, games, songs. Uh, we're building that English. Um, with not just me, but the parents and, and the, the people that bring them to these one-on-one -on -one sessions that we've had to have through COVID. And through COVID, each one of those children was able to keep coming and getting packets of information, being um, mentored and taught and sung to and learned about Christ. Um, through all that time, and this is the graduating group here that's all going to be able to go to kindergarten out of that valley where some areas, many areas, had in-person and not in-person, in-person and not in-person, and the education uh, was very sporadic. For these children, it was the same, and we stayed the same for yeah, Take a minute and introduce our This fellow. is Alba. Alba uh, is yeah. in the middle. She is my, the assistant has been really jumping on board. She's been part of that community for a long, long time, and um, she teaches there. Pastor uh, Benjamin Wildow, uh, ben, Benjamin Flores, he is from Bolivia, like, past, like uh, Gary had said, he's an alliance minister working um, with the uh, Lutheran Church there, and that's Pastor uh, Michael Wildauer. And he and his family came from Toga. Uh, Togo, uh, he has four children, and his wife Robin, and um, they are working on trying to build another church in the um, capital and in um, that's just about 10 minutes away from us, but he certainly enhances everything that we do. That is Alba. She is our person doing that one-on-one, -on -one, and that's how we were had to do it. I was in one room, she was in another, and the child and then the adult was to the side. They'd go over packets. Just like here, the parents and the older brothers and sisters kept trying to do their homework for them. So we had to go over that and make sure that they could do what they needed to do so that they could grow in the educational piece that they had. I also was able and asked to do um, English as a second language for the whole valley there. So children would come by um, two days of the week and sometimes we'd start out with three and then move to seven and then 17. You never knew how many people or at what level they were coming in. So I had to be very, very versatile on how I was teaching it. I do not speak Spanish, not yet. 117 <laughs> days today of Duolingo and we do have tutors now that are working with us um, on that but it wasn't needed to bring English to those children through games and stories and activities building their conversational Spanish sp conversational English so that they could really work with commerce later on that they could they could understand the school system when they got in you know, one story I like to tell is um, because Sue was not an official teacher um, in the eyes of the Belizean government, Sue didn't have to follow the same rules as a normal Belizean teacher had to follow. And specifically in this case, it was Elba was required to only have one student at a time, one student and a parent was all she could do at a time. Well, because Sue was not an official teacher, she, wasn't had, she didn't have that restriction. So what would happen is the children would be walking by the preschool and they'd be peeking to see if Sue's door was open. And Sue would end up with eight, 10 children at a time. And it wasn't officially school, so nobody ever said anything about it. So it was, it was always such a blessing. You didn't know how many children Sue would have, but you know, she was doing the religious education. So part of that also was a draw that I brought art to the area. The art isn't something that is ever in their hands. They don't paint, they don't draw, they don't have any kinds of things. They have some crayons and coloring books. That's as far as art goes in Belize. So um, bringing them uh, materials was a, a great draw. And then they got to hear the stories 
uh, from the Bible that we were going through with the younger ones, and the older ones got to do it too. They didn't even want to take their art home. They were so proud of it. I had it posted up in the room, and they kept checking in, and their cousins would come to see it and that. So it was a wonderful way, a wonderful outreach for that community. Well, the thing about art is finding the supplies. Yeah. yeah. And it can be a challenging thing to find um, any materials, really. And part of my job is to make sure I get materials for my workers. I have a, a construction crew that I manage. And these guys are really good, but we need to get the materials to them. And I will spend at least half of my day getting the materials so the guys have everything they need for the next day. And so I've become pretty good at finding stuff. Uh, you can find just about anything you need. Now, there's not a Home Depot or anything like that in Belize, but there's a hardware store here and there's one there and you know one might have more plumbing items than another and you know the different lumber yards where you can get to different. These are all things that I've learned over the last six months that enable me to do the job. And so here's the beginning of um, that Good Shepherd Church that we started with and um, it, it looks pretty sad there and you can see on the video the transformation that, that my guys were able to do. There was no services going on in this building yeah. before we got down. And, and actually the whole camp was owned by another um, denomination over the years and they wanted to leave Belize and they just no longer could support their ministry there. And so Herb and Marky Birch actually bought this ministry as part of their uh, the whole package, including the camp, we'll show you that more too, where we are, we were staying. So, but here's what we started with, and this ceiling up top, especially, you can't see so well, but it was just coming down. It was a mess. About halfway through, we're replacing that uh, that raised platform and modifying its shape a little bit. There's my guys working on it there. And now we've almost completed it there. You can see up top we've left the beans exposed for a couple reasons. I mentioned during the service that I have five projects waiting for me to come back. And one of them is to continue the work on this building here. We want to put some um, soundproofing insulation up top near the metal roof. If you're inside that building and it's raining hard like it does half of the year, it sounds like you're inside a drum. You can't even hear yourself think. So this is really an important part and that's one of the projects here in this building that I'll be doing. We also took the chairs that oh, were yeah. kind of decrepit in there. Uh, we, the guys disassembled them and Gary and I took all the material and scrubbed <laughs> and cleaned and washed and dried and did everything. They put it all back and they all turned out wonderful. So yeah, they're, they're very proud of putting plastic over them every time we're not in use and stuff. So everything's put back in pristine because they really appreciate the space. Yeah. The, the wood on the altar there mm -hmm. was specially picked oh, by the crew that was building. They wanted that different colors to reflect the different cultures they were working in yeah. in that Valley of Peace. So they wanted that altar to blend. The interesting them. thing about Belize is how many different cultures are packed in this little spot. There's at least five major ethnic groups living in Belize. Um, down on the coastline there's the Garifuna people and there are uh, escaped slaves from way back when that just settled in there and found a, p a peaceful place to live. There's the Creole which is just a mix of everybody and they tend to be more on the coast but also far away their political influence their numbers don't belie. Uh, there's the Mayan group that live within the mountainous areas closer to where we live and uh, they are truly the indigenous folks of Belize. Uh, there's a Latin American component, the Hispanics that come from all the other, other countries, especially Mexico and Guatemala and, Guatemala and El Salvador. And uh, so they're another ethnic component. And then finally, believe it or not, there's German influence. It's what? German. A German influence. They're the Mennonites. 
and they have moved first from Germany to uh, the US and Canada and then now into Belize and they are the farmers. They produce more food than anybody in Belize. And so they have a, quite a political influence even though they're only 10% of the population. But they, uh, they're really good at what they do. So we have all these mixes of people and so the wood that you see on that platform and on that altar rail demonstrates that. And the people in Belize are very proud of that. Uh, everybody's sort of able to get along well enough together that there's not any issues, not any problems. The project manager uh, made the rail and didn't realize that the shapes that are lit, that are carved out of there are all fish. So <laughs> it's a, it's a great This is a nice little tool. look, but you know what that is. Yeah. It's a fish. Yeah. So the community comes and uses this facility. It's a great, wonderful place for us to open up. So outside of uh, the, the teaching English and the other programs they have, we also offer a really safe, wonderful place. It's not a, it's not a scary place. It's just that there is lots of uh, area where it's not really level, and the children don't have an area where they can really do soccer and other kinds of things. So we use our space to open it up and to bring the children in the community to us. Yeah, there's Pastor Benjamin and his son Lucas. Um, to con finish up what, what Sue was saying about the, the composition of the soil, it's really interesting. It, it rains so much there that the soil acts like a sponge. And so when it's during the rainy season, everything's very soft and you're kind of muddy a little bit. But then it dries out and like a sponge, you got all these little pot marks everywhere. And it's Tailor made for a broken ankle. It looks so, smooth. It looks smooth, like... but whoop, there's a hole there and you don't even see it. And um, so that's why the children enjoy so much um, working on that cement area and playing on there. Another place I work is in, uh, it's in Orange Walk. Orange Walk's in the north uh, west part of the country. It's, its nickname is Sugar City because it's surrounded entirely by sugarcane fields. That's the primary employer. And uh, so that's the second place I was working. And there's another, that's what a, the other church looked like when we started. This is a church that we were able to complete just in time for Palm Sunday. And so if you remember the video and all the, the palms in, in, those, uh, in, that, in that part of the, the video, well, that's this church, but that's what we started with. The building is sound. Uh, it's really in pretty good shape, but it was a derelict building for the last 10 years. It had been broken into. Every bit of anything worth value was stolen. Every bit of copper, every bit of fixtures, everything gone. And that's what we ended up with. So my guys are really miracle workers, I think, sometimes. We're just getting started then, but the first thing you gotta do is you just pull everything out and you power wash everything. You can see the floor still a little wet down over here on the right side. No lights, no ceiling fans, yeah, none of nothing. them. But. And there it is, now we're finished. And uh, the reason why we decided to invest in this property up in Orange Walk was for this man right here. Um, you'll see another photo of him next as well. That's Roldan Rios. Now, Roldan is a former Presbyterian minister. He is himself from Peru and has lived in Belize for the last 30 years. And um, Roldan is going through what they call the colloquy program, meaning he's being mentored and taught Lutheran doctrine by by the way, by Michael Wildauer. And as he's learning the doctrine, he gets his Lutheran credentials. So eventually he's gonna be a more indigenous uh, pastor for the Belizean people. The reason why we invested in this property is because Roldan has started a house church. And it has grown and grown to the point that he can't fit everybody in his own home where they used to meet. Hence, we needed to find a spot for him. That's why the 4 said, yeah, 
we want to invest in this property and we want to develop it. Roald Dahn's there on the very far left. There it is on Palm Sunday. By the way, that's, I didn't realize it just, just now, that's Roald Dahn's elder son, who is an engineer, by the way, a civil engineer. Um, I mentioned that I had those five projects, and this is another one of the projects, and we need to do the same thing about putting up the insulation up on the ceiling uh, and, and near the metal roof for more soundproofing than anything else. With all the lights that we put in and all the fans, it's relatively comfortable, even in the hot weather, but that sound is just what's, what's really needed. And they're looking from in the church as everybody's getting ready to have the procession to come in for Palm Sunday. I mentioned the sign bite, which is on the Placencia Peninsula. The Placencia Peninsula is the second most popular tourist destination in Belize. Um, people go to places like Placencia Village. They go to places like Maya Beach. They're well developed. But the folks that work at those places live in Sunbite. This is Christ Lutheran Church. That, uh, the, that was the first church that uh, the Belize Mission uh, built and put up. Belize Mission is relatively new. It's only been in there for seven, month, or seven years. There is another organization that we work very closely with, the Belize Mission Society. They've been there in Belize now for about 15 years, and this is where they work. So if you're kind of interested in working in this environment, that's really who I would pass you off to because they're doing good work. But the, Belize, the Lutheran Mission in Belize is involved in the whole country. So we'll take you to different parts of the country. Love the BMS. And uh, through their work, the, the church decided to put up this, this uh, church building. You can see we're worshiping underneath the church, and that is because we have someone in a wheelchair that can't go to the uh, upper part that has the congregation in it. The, one of the reasons why the uh, Lutheran church picked uh, this area to go into was because um, uh, the people that were going to the resorts and things were not um, living in pristine areas or having a really good wage to live on. Um, so this area is right next to really fancy resorts. Now the resorts over there that are on the coastal area are not run by Hyatt and everything else. They're Belizean run. It's, they're very focused in on making sure their people get um, jobs and that so they do have jobs they have food and there's re relatively uh, safe but you can see four or five families and they make homes and whatever they have this is Mary Luz she is part of the congregation there in Senbite um, she has twin baby girls that she's raising she just gave birth to and that is the garbage dump that is right across the street from her she's living in a container like you'd see in the back of a truck or a train. And that's where she's raising these baby girls that we got to see being baptized mm. there in the church <laughs> while we were there. It was a really wonderful time, and that's Pastor Micah Wildauer yeah. there. And her, her birch was actually doing the, the watering yeah, during yeah, the baptism. Yeah. He's, he's, he's our leader, yeah. So. There's, uh, a, there's a photo of uh, Pastor Micah. Another place that we work in a, uh, on the coast is a little town called Riversdale. That's more um, Hispanic in uh, their heritage, but it's right on the coast, and they've um, they've embraced our coming and doing what they call a kids club. We do it after service on Sundays, about every other Sunday, and they've given us this is the community area that's uh, on the beach, yeah, not too bad, right? Um, but they've given us a couple of picnic tables that yep, we put we up there. We built two picnic tables, picnic they're tables. side by side, so it actually has two picnic tables filled with children that you can't see there. And it is really fun watching Micah walk through that village. He plays the guitar, and so he walks through the village strumming his guitar, singing away, and to watch all the kids just pouring out of the homes because they know it's time for kids club and they just follow them to this area it's like the Pied Piper it's uh, 
it's always a, a real joy to see that happening, yeah. This is home sweet home. That's where we've lived for the last six months. Uh, 350 square feet. Hey, it's really, they gave us a break. They put on the front porch, which gave us about another 120 square feet, which became, uh, oh, there's our kitchen. It's a one person kitchen. Um, we both can't get in there and cook at the same time. It just, you have an easy room. bake oven, see? <laughs> Yeah, small fridge and a little easy bake oven. And that's one of our friends. They're, there's iguanas everywhere. And uh, they, they're nice because they help keep the rodents down and they keep the bugs down. So we don't mind them being around. That's looking out of our porch. Now, our front porch served as our living room, dining room, and as you can see, my office and other things as well. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. But this, we're showing this not so much to say, oh, wasn't it great where we live? We're showing this because it shows you the compound where we live. And this place is called Camp Concordia. If you bring a team down, you could be staying in Camp Concordia. It's got what we're looking at, the dining hall. And that's also doubling as our worship space. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a dedicated worship space. We have plans for it, but with all the other things going on, just haven't gotten to it. Um, this is a 40-person bunkhouse. This is one of my other construction projects I'll be working with. And here's, we're looking at it inside. Uh, yeah, you can see it needs a little bit of work. And uh, we'll have that up and running great in a couple of months for so there's a men's side and a women's side, right. and there is facilities in there, plus a shower house and bathrooms yeah. and laundry facilities yeah. there. So another shot of the dining hall. And like Sue mentioned, there is a separate shower building, one side for women, one side for men. Um, everything, if, if you think upgraded Boy Scout camp, that's kind of what Camp Concordia is like. We're going to continue to upgrade that but we're already seeing we could probably use some more room. Again, this is the sort of thing that the foro determines. They all get together and they say, hmm, we could do this or that, any number of projects that we might be able to do. Um, it all happens because of the foro. So in my working with Alicia there as one of my preschoolers, her mom and I got to make a really good relationship. A good part, and Pastor will back us up on that, is building those relationships, a good part of missionary work. Spending time, being with them, investing in them. And that's what I did with her. We got to talking and I found out that we had something in common. I have a love and, and have been trained to work with special needs children. And I worked for Easter Seals, who works with disabled children for two years too. Um, and she had Angel there living in her home. He is her nephew. He's nine years old and she was carrying him everywhere. I had just heard about him, that she was carrying him, that he was disabled, he only could move his head a little bit and a little bit of his, his hands, a little full arm, but not much. The rest of him, he can't talk, he can smile really well, but I was concerned just hearing about it, so grabbed Pastor and we made a home visit. Prayed with the family, got to see Angel, they took care of him very well. Um, but carrying a nine-year-old isn't something that's going to go very well for his future. So we had to step with them and see how we can help. And so an offer of, do you think we should start seeking a wheelchair um, came up. I didn't want to solve all their problems. I'm not the American doing it my way. I just offered to say, you know, we could seek this out. I'm not sure I can do this and I don't know if you want it. And they were very, very excited about that might be a good future for us. But we found out <laughs> that wheelchairs in Belize are far uh, used. They are used everywhere because sugarcane is their main crop. They, they grow sugar cane for cash. And sugar and diabetes are really good together right there. So there's so many people with amputees 
that the wheelchairs are really hard to find. The other thing that happens is the medical community isn't as prominent and, 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 and so enlightened as we are here. So the birthing process, there's many problems that go on. And Angel is one of them. So that dislocation of a spinal area affects them the rest of their life or the lack of oxygen affects them the rest of their life. And so we found out that when there was a wheelchair, it was swept up. I came home asking him, listen, you're the guy that's out there everywhere throughout the country. Where can we find a wheelchair? Yeah, and it, this really speaks to the importance of having boots on the ground. And that, that's who Sue and I are. We're your boots on the ground. We welcome short-term teams. We value them. I cut my teeth on short-term teams, so we know the value of that. But there's another kind of value because we are there in a, over a longer period of time. We make those relationships. We meet these people and find out the felt need. So Sue says, find me a wheelchair. Okay, no problem, I can find anything, right? Wrong. As Sue mentioned, every wheelchair is snatched up because there are so many amputees due to the diabetes and the prevalence of it there. So I'm speaking, I think I introduced to you before, to, to Pastor Rios, Roldan Rios. And um, I was saying, hey, can, I find, can you help me find a wheelchair? And he goes, well, what do you need a wheelchair for? I tell him the story about Elgin and then he, or about Angel. And Roldan says, well, let me tell you a story. He said, about five years ago, there was an, a ministry that used to come down here once a year to do wheelchair ministry. It's called Calms. Uh, they're still working in Honduras and, uh, and Panama, uh, particularly. And they would bring wheelchair chairs down. And what they would do is they would size people almost a year and a head to uh, make sure that when they brought a wheelchair down, that wheelchair was for this person. And because wheelchairs have to be fitted. They are, it's, it's like a glove. You need to have the right size for the right person. And so they brought down all these wheelchairs and they would bring a team to help do the distribution. And they distributed all their wheelchairs and there was one wheelchair left. Uh, and they called the people, come, come get your wheelchair. No response. A year went by, they called them again, no response. Finally, they said, well, we're not gonna need the wheelchair after all. Uh, so rolled on through it in his, in his garage and has been collecting dust there for the last three years. Until I called, he says, if that wheelchair will fit that little boy, you can have it. And there she be. Every it's, good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows, from James 1, 17. This chair was perfect. It had braces for his body to hold him up. It had a Velcro vest to go and hold his body back. It had a space for his head to keep him just right that could be adjusted for his size as he grew. Everything could be bumped out and moved out. The wheels are really sturdy. There's no pavement there. It's all rock and rubble uh, roads. And so he has to make it everywhere he goes in that. And it was so complete that the pack on the back of it wasn't made of material that will rot in this this climate of, of moisture it's made of leather so we brought it to church and we put it angel in it to see if he fit and he did and you can <laughs> see he's reaching down with his hand we actually have a little video too but um, he moved his body himself for the first time in his life it changed his life. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> this young man is part of the community now. He's out on his porch. His, his aunt is wheeling him where he goes. And when she comes to preschool, she brings Angel. And guess who gets to use my Easter Seals background of building muscle strength and that on his body and his legs um, with him. So God has paired up and prepared me 
and him for the time that we have. You know, we, we thought we were going to do teaching and right. building, and, and we have. But God had something else in mind for us as well. And it was this. And once again, to mention the foro and its usefulness is when the foro heard about this story and the need of wheelchairs throughout Belize, Foros decided, okay, we're going to support this unknown ministry to them at the time. And so gratefully, the Foro has authorized $5,000 to expand on this ministry to enable us to purchase more wheelchairs and do that work. So there's others out there that have various needs for special needs, and that's why the Foro put that money together. But the community in Valley of Peace gave us a moniker. It calls us the church that cares. There are churches in Valley of Peace. They do step in. They do not offer free education like we do. We are with them for the long haul, and we're there to help them. So we are the church that cares in their eyes. Yeah. He can move the wheel. He can he can't move it. He, turn it all the way. He doesn't he quite have enough yet, he hasn't strength used yet to he move hasn't, himself. I can see some little posts sticking out. That yeah. Can, you know. could, yeah. 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 We sure could do some modifications. Time. We don't yeah. know how to do Just that sort of thing. Just the fact that he's out in the community now, yeah. and that it's it's a way for him to grow and for them to see him. He is joining in with the kids now at the kids clubs and the things that we offer at church. They bring him down. He's part of them. Other kids are moving him around to be part of them. So he is, he is a, a vital part of that community now, where before he was in a room in the back and maybe out on the porch carrying him. So made a big so difference. Yep. Yeah. It's very, they're, very they're, strong. They're pretty stout. It's yeah. a pretty good well, wheelchair. Larger diameter than the yeah, uh, the most of it was the, the metal rigging on there that was holding up and stuff. So that's what, yeah. what, and then the front wheels are very sturdy and strong. And those are the ones that over time we know from other people that we've had, uh, there was another person at the other church uh, in San Bite that, I mean, she's on her third wheelchair because the front wheels were getting torn up and she is a very heavy set person. And so um, things happen. But there is a past, uh, I mean, a, a, uh, a doctor that had come down. We told him about this. And he's working on uh, connecting us with wheelchairs through, uh, uh, through a community, a medical community that actually overhauls regularly their wheelchairs. We'll and see how that so comes out. We'll see. Uh, yeah, Dr. Rippus came and visited us. You know, we're really blessed. Missionaries are always blessed because people are visiting them. And, you know, we think it's great. We can show you the work we're doing. We're glad that you're interested. And so we often had visitors come and see us. One of the visitors was Chris Whitby. He is, um, the Reverend Whitby is the assistant to the Director. district president in charge of missions. Well, he wanted to see what we were doing, and he came down. Um, I think maybe his good report had something to do with the district uh, making Belize a mission focus. Another organization we, I mentioned before, BMS, they're uh, out of uh, Belvedere, and so they do con continue to good work. The doctor we're referring to is a man named Dr. Stephen Rippus, and he works with Ministries and Missions. Now, they're another RSO that's based out of um, the Cleveland area. And so he is very interested in bringing in more medical personnel on a regular basis. So there, I, all this to say that we were going we're gonna to have a lot of visitors, and we hope to have a lot of teams, and we'd hope that you might be a part of that as well. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll take this time and just open it up for any questions anybody might have, and uh, we'll be glad to answer them if we can. We came in later, so maybe you introduced this in the beginning. When did you start working down here, and how long have you been there? 
Yeah, okay, well, the, the Lutheran, ministry, Lutheran Mission in Belize has been there for seven years. Belize Mission Society has been in there 15 years. BMS focused strictly on feeding programs and uh, educational scholarships for the children in Senbite, that one town. Uh, the Lutheran Mission in Belize in works in <coughs> over the entire country in focusing on three things, spreading the gospel, planning Lutheran churches, and showing mercy. And so that's why um, we were able to do the wheelchair missions, that's under the heading of showing mercy. The reconstruction work that I'm doing oftentimes has, has to do with planning Lutheran churches. So everything we do is within those three components. So Sue and I were there um, uh, September 15th. We were asked to go in as volunteer missionaries maybe the lowest rung of the ladder, of the missionary ladder, if you will. And we were there for six months. And uh, we came home uh, March 12th. We started our training to be geo-owned missionaries on March 14th. They gave us two days off. How nice, thank you. And it's been a, it's been a ride since then. And so we've, we were trained, uh, we put together our slide presentation, and we've been speaking to churches to, to build our network of support so that we can go and continue to stay if God should have that in mind. Yeah, Gary, so what are some of the new foods that you've had a chance to eat now? <laughs> well, you know, the food in Belize is surprisingly similar to what you can find here in the U.S., uh, just more of certain things. Like I, I've mentioned before, is Belize is a great first-timer uh, place for a short-term, uh, for a short-termer for the very first time because it's just foreign enough to know that you're in another country, but it's so familiar and they speak English. But basically, the food in in Belize is, like many Latin American countries, beans and rice. Chicken is the real deal, but since we're on the coast, a lot of fresh fish for sure. Um, abundance of fresh vegetables, uh, often homegrown, and the markets are a great place to get the freshest of straight all vegetables. We buy straight from the farmers. Yeah. Clean food, very it's, clean. It's, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Avocados, when in season, abundance, uh, papayas, mangoes, all the, the, the normal tropical fruits you'll find, pineapples, when they're in season, but they all come in season together. And so when there's lettuce coming in, everybody's giving you lettuce. And we have tons and tons of lettuce that we're spreading around everybody we know because it all comes in at the same time. And so, um, that's how fresh everything Camp is. Camp Concordia is filled. Um, uh, Pastor Birch's wife is just so passionate about gardening. So she has all these wonderful fruit trees yeah. and citrus trees and that, and there's nothing like straight from the tree. But there is one uh, 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 fruit that I've never had before. It's called sour sap. And uh, it was a, it's a flavor over there in ice cream or whatever else they have and stuff and <laughs> juices and things like that. And it is very good. Um, the one thing that everyone loves over there that we're not that passionate about yeah, was, really. was coconut wa uh, water. So, yeah, they hack up the coconut and they drink the water straight from the coconut. And, and we, then they pitch the coconut. We, <laughs> we're like, so much about the, coconut the best meat. part, the meat part inside. So, yeah, I had to it's run okay. out and, and hide the coconuts so that I could have them to actually eat the meat inside. So. The, the ever missionaries love it, so maybe yeah, we'll get yeah. a taste for it in time. <laughs> What, what, uh, what sort of size do your short-term mission teams uh, range in? I think an optimal size for a team is maybe 12. We can take less and maybe up to 20. Um, as I mentioned, that, that bunkhouse, we could pack 40 people into that. It's, you know, 10 on each side, 10 bunk beds on each side. It'd be pretty tight, but it's doable. It's just when the teams get that large, it's kind of hard to manage that many people. Unless we have a, a specific um, activity in mind. One of the things they really want us to do is to start focusing in on the ESL training. Yep. And our thought with that is just bring down folks and let you become an English as a second language coach. 
and it's you and one of the locals and you just hang out and we'll bring you through activities we'll do a vbs type event so that it's exciting for the kids and what it is is you just chat it up and that's how they get to learn english conversational english you don't have to know how to speak spanish to do that but you just need to have that time and so that is one thing they're really asking us to emphasize on of course, we, you've seen all the construction work that I'm doing, um, and we welcome folks that want to engage in that kind of work. It is hot. We'll probably have you work half a day. Maybe work on your spiritual formation on the other half. How about that? The idea is these guys really know what they're doing. They know the materials. They know the construction techniques that work. And we'll just put you under there. Uh, supervision and we'll get some work done if that's what you have in mind so families also are very welcome families Children are welcome of all different ages. we mentioned the uh, the medical team aspect um, you know when um, when we were there it's a sad thing but the government does have medical care being what it is and Valley of Peace does have a doctor and a nurse assigned, and they're given a housing and a, and a clinic to work at. But there's, there's a lack of empathy. I don't know, the best thing I could say. We had a, a lady in the village that went into labor, and during that process, she started bleeding. And she was bleeding very badly, and they took her to the clinic, and it was after hours, so the doctor refused to see her. Can you imagine? And evidently, this happens all the time. The so they okay, and mom's okay. Lots they, of time in the hospital. They, they packed her up and they took her into Belmapon, which was about 20 miles away, and they got her to the emergency room in time. Six hours of surgery later, she's okay. The baby's okay, but it was a pretty close call. It's not so, uncommon. And that's not an uncommon activity. Their idea of medical care, there is some really good medical care if you're willing to pay for it. Most people can't afford it. Um, so that's why there is such a need for really just ongoing medical care. You don't need, I mean, we'll, wel we'll welcome any surgeons or anything like that that have real expertise. And that's what Stephen Rippus is doing. He's making connections with these hospitals to say, we can bring some, some doctors down to do advanced things if you want. But there's this, also this huge need for just basic medical care. Um, so anyone that's a nurse, nurse practitioner, whatever your skill level is in the medical field, you are valuable down there. So that's another aspect. My idea with missions is if you have a skill that you think that might be useful, come and talk to me. We might be able to find a place for you. If not, look at the Synod could use you. If you've got a business background, and I'm just doing my plug for the Synod, not because I have to, but if you have a business background yeah. uh, in accounting, financing, they're, they're in need right now two business managers at the regional level. And what you do is you help with the budgeting as a region a whole. Now we're part of the Latin American, Central American region. Now we're okay, but especially the Asian region, Never. based out of Taiwan, they need business managers and they've needed them for two years. So if you know somebody like that and might be interested in, in, in serving the Lord in that capacity overseas, let me know about it. Or let, you know, let the Office of International Missions know about it. I guarantee you, you'll be in the field in less than six months. There's because that's how badly the they need that parts, kind of skill yeah. set. So you never know what skills you bring to the table. Come and see if you're interested. We really want to keep you uh, informed on yeah. what we're doing mm -hmm. uh, through videos, through uh, our newsletters. So make sure that you get your name um, uh, and an email address so that we can keep you up to date. Gary's really good at doing little videos. He did them for the six months we were down there. And so he actually has a YouTube channel that you can talk to him about. To check, it, <laughs> yeah. check it out to see what we've done um, over there during those six months also. 
Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Are the two of you bilingual? No. No. Um, I had um, two years of Spanish in college, so many years ago, <laughs> and uh, it's pretty rusty. Uh, but this is a requirement in the Latin American region that everyone, regardless of where you're going to be stationed, you will learn Spanish. And so we're in the process of some real intense Spanish learning. We have one-on-one -on -one tutors right now. We meet three days, three days a week for two hours. We're actually going to the Dominican Republic first for two months of additional intense training. So that'll help us be more effective even though English is a spoken language. But English is really needed there, not the Spanish. Yeah. We are at that time yep. where we should start to transition. Uh, Ingo was uh, kind of interested, like where you're uh, retired from, and you have roots from Illinois. Oh, really? Yeah. South Elgin, Illinois. you retire and so then you, that's when you went to. Well, yeah, this was the way God decided he well, wanted us to yeah, retire. Yeah, God retired us through COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't really ready to end my career in the DuPage Children's Museum, but um, God did that, and it was through some time and prayer that we saw that. Yeah. So put that direction in front of us. What do we do with this? So, yeah. We and here, here, this the is the other out. message we want to give you is we're just regular folks. I was a retired semi-truck driver. You know, we're nobody special. We're, we're Joe Blow and Jane Doe who sits in the pews. And we just heard God's call and we said yes. And you all can say yes too for a week here or there. You can say yes here yes. in North Chicago you and the Hispanic outreach. ministry. Wonderful. Boy, that's exciting oh, to see outreach. that happening. Yes. Yeah, your comfort so, dog ministry needs help. Your, your, your yeah. outreach to the communities need help. So yeah, yeah be a missionary. Amen. Guys, let's, uh, let's close uh, with the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, okay. mm -hmm. Our, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.